welcome everyone to the Learning Clinic on CKLU 96.7 FM. I'm your host, Bob Kerwin. And as usual, on most Monday afternoons, we have another edition of the Learning Clinic Meet Your Candidates radio show. This afternoon, I have in the studio with me Aaron Boger, who's running in uh, Ward 9. Hello, how is everybody out there today? Yeah, and, and this is Aaron's second time time on the show. One of the things we're trying to do is um, make sure that everyone who's running for council and for um, school board and for mayor, um, that everybody has a chance to come in and, and do a show, do an interview, try and give people in our listening audience an opportunity to um, get to know a little bit more of the issues and get to know a little bit more of the candidates that are running. The, the primary purpose is to um, make sure that as we're going through the, the process and we're going through the campaign that everybody in, in the city of Erie Sarbury can have a good idea of what the underlying um, issues are in this election and, and moving forward. Uh, quite often we, we hear about things like transit and infrastructure and moving railways and, and economic development, but, but we never have a chance really to talk about the issues. And I think the best people to talk to are the candidates. So, so Aaron, this is the second time you've been in. I think you were in a, a couple of weeks ago. We, we've been taking a look at some of the major issues and some of the major concerns that people in Sudbury are talking about. And one of the things that I've been able to find as I'm talking to different candidates from different wards is there's a lot of commonality in terms of our issues. Even though we're all running for individual words, a lot of the issues are, they're common, yeah. no matter where you go. Um, anything new that we haven't discussed before that has come up, or anything new on the, uh, the campaign trail, or, or the people you're talking to that uh, are surprising you at this point? Well, not, I wouldn't say surprising. I think a lot of the conversations that uh, we're having are about lowering taxes and getting uh, spending under control. You know, uh, there's a lot of um, wasted time and energy as well uh, when, when you look at some of the things that Council's been discussing at, uh, at City Hall right now, especially the last week with their, um, in the last meeting that they had you know, with uh, the taxi uh, wasting, you know, uh, an hour or so, or almost an hour talking about some, some issues that shouldn't really be taking that long to talk about. They got to get right down to some, some real city business, you know, get the, get the issues sorted out. I, I've, been, I've been hearing that a little bit uh, from a lot of different people and, and, and as I'm talking to different candidates, and it does seem as if as a city council, I mean, it's probably not just something that's happened to this particular city council. It's probably happened over the years. It's just that we, we seem as a group to really get hung up on, I don't want to say minor issues, because the, the taxi issue is a major issue. The, you know, anything to do with funding or budgeting is major. But, but we seem to get hung up on the smaller items and spend a lot of time doing things that really should be a quick decision. Yeah. It, it, it's, I don't know what, how, how you solve that. Are there certain things that we should be letting staff take care of and, and we step back on or? Um... Well, there has to be accountability. So when, should we let staff uh, do those, make some of those decisions, you know, there has to be a, a level of accountability there as well. You know, like when, uh, uh, if they make a bad decision, there should be something that can be done about it. You know, like even the uh, what the rebranding came in, uh, came in. They they went out. They made the decision to to rebrand, and uh, it's my understanding that a lot of people aren't happy with the with what was used to re the to rebrand it. So, do we? How do we ensure that? when we do send something out to the staff that we, we like what we're going to get, you know, and what do we do if we don't? And I guess that, that really gets into this whole issue of uh, giving people a task, giving them the parameters, and then having the, I guess, the ability and, and the willingness to step back and say, 
we're going to have to accept what you gave us. If, if we gave you the authority to go and do this, otherwise I think what's, what we run into is, uh, uh, and it's not just in politics, it's in business, you, what you run into is this whole uh, worker productivity problem where people are going to say, well, it doesn't matter what you tell me to do, it doesn't matter what I do, when I bring it back to you, you're going to change anyway. Yeah. So why should I put a whole lot of effort into doing this? And, 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 I, and you really walk a fine line as counselors because we're the ones that end up hearing the complaints. Yeah. If, if staff does something that the public is not happy with, then the first people they dump on are their counselors, their elected official. Yeah. So you really, I, I don't know what the answer is, but it does seem as if a lot of time is spent dealing with issues that uh, could best be left um, to be handled by, by staff and, and possibly by committees where we're missing on a lot of the bigger issues. And, and I know I think you and I talked about some of the bigger issues before, but uh, for the sake of people who haven't been listening before, what do you think are the major issues that council has to address over the next four years? Right now, I think one of the really major issues, and it, it kind of caught me off uh, by surprise, is the, uh, the new arena that, we're, that they're looking to build. I think that's going to become a, a big election issue, not so much for the, the councillors, but for, I think, uh, the mayor. But that's a big issue that has to be dealt with in, in the next uh, four years, and hopefully it's the, a new council that does make the decision uh, whether to go ahead with it or to go ahead with it, and with which manner that we do go ahead with it. And I think that's going to be a major issue as well. And obviously, uh, the, some of the spending in, in down at City Hall is another major issue that's going to be yeah. that's going to have to be addressed. Let's go, let's go back to that arena situation for a minute. I, I know you've got a uh, hockey background, and and my kids all grew up playing hockey, and and, and I know it's not just hockey. There's ring at, there's figure skating, and and we're talking about an arena that could be a a, a multi-purpose. Uh, oh. Yeah, definitely. Area. The, I, I think the, what I've heard a number of people talk about though, and, and I've heard this not just this year but over the years, is that the city of Greater Sudbury, with all of its amalgamated outlying areas, was never designed for centralization. Especially when you get to things like arenas and community centers. Is that when you when you take a look at the arenas in Hanmer and Belcarron and Capriol and and uh, and Walden and and, and Constant, when you take a look at where all those arenas have been located, they were they were located for the specific community areas that they were in, and and even in the the arenas in Sudbury, were, you know, are dotted in the different sections of Sudbury. Yeah. To put a multiplex or a four pad arena where everybody from, from the outlying area and, and every, everybody can go to because you've got, got a, a place where you've, you've centralized your services. It may be cheaper to operate the arena, but it defeats the purpose of these settlement areas that are 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes away. And, and I heard one person even said, you know, when we're, when we're talking about conserving fuel and we're talking about the environment, uh, the idea of building a place where everybody has to drive to kind of defeats the purpose of protecting the environment and reducing the use of your vehicles. Yeah, and, <laughs> well I think with the, the fourplex and, and things like that, you have to have a, a central location. You know, people come in from out of town, uh, a lot of business is made from, uh, uh, from when there are tournaments and everything that come in from out of town. So you want to have one central location where they could go uh, you know, you have hotels around that location where they can stay. There's nobody that's coming to Sudbury wants to be traveling a half an hour in between to different areas of the city. That that's just the reality of it. It might not sound nice, but that's the reality of it. So it's 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 more beneficial, I think, to the local economy to have you know a centralized area for arenas and you know, your hotels and everything around those arenas. Like, I, I'm a big supporter of a fourplex, and I think that it's long overdue to have one, a four-pad arena, not a fourplex, mm -hmm. sorry. It, it, oh, yeah, absolutely. I, but I, I think it would be nice to have them, but, but if it's going to take away from the arenas in in Hanmer and Valcara and Capriol, 
and it's going to take away from the arenas in Walden, and it's going to take away from the smaller arenas. If in order to put up a, a four pad arena, you have to close four pads in the outlying areas. Well, I don't think that, that, that we have to, though, because if you look at it, it would, I looked at one report, I think it was, uh, what do we, I think we need nine arenas to, to accommodate the city of our size, and we have a seven point four arenas, or whatever the, the study had said. So we need, we need more of, of those things, right? I, yeah, depending on yeah, what studies you look at. Uh, it's, that, that, I think, is going to be uh, a really hot-button topic when, when we it, get into the discussion at the table. And, yeah, and you have to look at, too, where, where is it being used? You know, uh, is there more of a, a demand for a, an arena in the city where you have uh, your, more people are going to go and use it rather than somewhere else, you know? Oh, it, 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 and it's all, it all comes down to, uh, uh, it, it's going to be speculation. But it has to be done right, and you know, I, I'm really in favor of, of pri uh, privatizing for the arena, you know, a, a public-private partnership, something to that effect would be uh, really beneficial. Yeah. I think you'd have, if you look at other arenas down south that are uh, public-private or private, they have, you know, some like restaurants in the arenas and stuff like that where you, you can go, you can stay, you can eat. You know, yeah. and then the city can get property tax revenue off of it. They're not yeah. getting it now, you know. So no, I, yeah, it, it, I mean it does have. I mean, there, there are an awful lot of benefits to having some place like that, that to go. And, and I, and I'm sure that it is going to be something that comes to the table again. Um, you're right. We have to do it right. We have to make it big enough, uh, so that it can support the concerts. And, and I really don't think another five thousand seat rank is, is going to be big enough. No, I know. I think that's kind of a waste of a waste of money to do that. You have, uh, if you look in, and another thing too is if you look in London in two thousand and two, they built their arena, a nine thousand seat arena, and it has uh, luxury suites and, and that, and they spent forty two million on a nine thousand seat arena to build in a public private partnership, right? So, and we're looking at spending eighty five million. And that's without any over overhead on a six thousand seat arena. You know, so even the talk about spending that kind of money on something that's not even, won't even be as, as, as beneficial to, to our city as, say, the one in London was to theirs for half the price. You know, there's... Yeah, that's going to raise a lot of objectors. Yeah, it is. You know, so we have to be sure that we're, we're going to be able to do it, uh, you know, make it so it's affordable in a sense where our cost of it to build it is going to be in line with other communities that have built those types of arenas. So there's no reason we should be building something for 85 or 100 million if another city can do it for half the price and do a public-private, you know? Yeah, yeah the public-private uh, concepts work, like you say, that the programs work if, if you've got, if, you, if it's viable for the business that's coming in and, and uh, if you've got the willingness of the council to give up a little bit of their, their control. control, yeah. Which is always an interesting question. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's not, you're, you're not taking any jobs away by putting it in the private sector. You know, there, there's still going to be people there. They still have to have people do the restaurant, if there's a restaurant in there. Yeah. You still have to have people cleaning. You still have to have uh, the people doing the Zamboni or any of the maintenance in the arena. So it's not, you're not taking away any jobs by putting it in the private sector. What you're doing is you're allowing more freedom and you're allowing more, uh, more opportunity for, for uh, property tax revenue. Yeah. Where, which you're not getting right now. Yeah. So I don't see really how it's a negative. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm going to make a note of that, that, that. That's probably a topic that I should look at over the course of the next couple of months and bring in three or four people from the recreation area and, and talk about the pros and cons of a multi-pad arena. It would be, uh, be an interesting discussion to have three or four people in. We had people from uh, uh, Senior Friendly or, or Friendly Senior Sudbury Group yeah, a couple weeks ago, and it was interesting discussing the three members of that organization talking about what they're looking for in the future from council, um, from the perspective of seniors. And, and I think when we take a look at the recreation people and talk about what they're looking at in terms of the multi-pad complex, it, it, it's, it's an eye-opener to hear what, they're, what kind of leadership they're looking for yeah. in council. And, and 
and how they expect it to be paid for. Yeah. No, and that's it. For me, I, I'd rather have, if not have to pay for it if I don't use it. You know, you have your user fees, and if it's public private, you're not really your property taxes don't don't necessarily have to go up to fund something like this. Whereas, uh, you know, if it was strictly public, then it's going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money to subsidize to it. subsidize it, which shouldn't, uh, you know, and it's not fair to either to the people that don't use the arenas or don't don't have to go in there. You know. Yeah. Hey, that's good. Let's get on to the topic of taxes. What are you hearing about? taxes are, are people really are they upset with the fact that taxes are going up or are they upset with the fact that they don't seem to think they're getting uh, good value for the money they're putting out I think it's uh, it's both they they see that they're not getting the services that other communities are getting for less taxes now the where you look at uh, the the outlining areas and thing and things like that. There, there isn't a lot of services that they get, that the, you know that they would expect to get for the the amount of taxes they pay. Yet in Sudbury, the you know the mill rate is higher, so even people in Sudbury are paying a lot more than, than and not getting the the services in return. So people are talking about how, yeah, it's nice to say that you're going to cut taxes, but we still want to have some of the services that we want, you know and. But you can't. We aren't getting either of them right now, so that's where the conversation is going. Uh, how do you how do you deal with that if you get on council? Well, well, you have to. Well, you have to make the certain cuts. You know, and you have to really prioritize what's important to the community and what uh, taxpayers are willing and what they want to pay for. And uh, that's part of my campaign. Is I think you know we when we look at uh, all the vacant buildings in the city. Those are vacant buildings that we could be selling and then collecting property tax revenue off of, you know, and that's just one way to, to help help the the increase stop the increase of, of the property taxes that we are getting. So you're almost saying we have to be a better business. Well, we do. That's well, yeah, because you have a half a billion dollar budget every year that you're going with, right? You can't you can't not be a better business. <laughs> if it, if it was the private sector, we'd be bankrupt if we keep yeah. adding like that. No. So, so we, we have to operate, uh, this is more, I'm just thinking out loud, we, yeah. we almost have to operate more as a business would and stop thinking of ourselves as a public sector organization that gets grant money. But we have to be more businesslike. Well, we have to be businesslike in the sense that we have to be smarter where we spend our money and we have to prioritize our needs a little bit better. We can't, we can't offer everything that through the, the community that's already being offered through the private sector. And if we can save ourselves, uh, you know, even if we save ourselves four or five million a year in the budget, that, br that brings our property tax increase down, you know, under the rate of inflation, which is something that we should be looking at. I hear a lot of people talking about the, uh, the idea that we have to do a review of the, re review of all of the departments and figure out, you know, which departments are overstaffed and which ones are understaffed and move people around and, and I'm getting the impression that people think that we're not getting the kind of productivity out of a lot of uh, the people. You know, I, I, at the end of the day, it's not, I, I think that we are. I think that the people that work there, I've, I worked before for the region, when it was the region, I was in engineering and construction mm -hmm. services there. So I see the, so pe the people do work, they, they do what they're told. You know, as a, as generally you go to work, you do what you're told. What we're we're missing on is we're not holding the people accountable who are making the decisions. Okay. I mean, you have uh, around Christmas time it was minus fifty, and I have a road crew out there filling in potholes in minus fifty. Now, who told that crew to? Obviously, they're the workers. They're just come to work to do their job, you know. And and you you see, well, who's making the decision to send them out to fill a pothole in minus fifty when you know the asphalt isn't going to stick? It isn't, you know. It, does that boss need to be? retrain to know not to send your workers to go and do that because that's a big waste of money so where are we going to hold those people accountable you know that's what we should be looking at and stuff like that because i don't think the workers are unproductive everybody mm -hmm. goes to, to work to do their job you yeah know? and i've been saying it i've been saying you know nobody goes to work not to work no so maybe we're not doing it wisely maybe we're not doing it efficiently no, and then you can't blame the worker for that, right? No. <clears> then <throat> that's one thing. 
if you do look at, there's uh, major problems with, I, I guess, some of the, the way that we do operate our city in that, in that sense. Like, who, who's sending people out to do things that are costing us a ton of money, that are painting bike lanes in, in November? You know, why are we painting bike lanes in November? We're not going to use the bike lanes till, till April, and they're going to have uh, uh, snow and salt and chewing up everything that you've done. So there's a big waste of money there, too. I mean, why are we wasting money like that? You know, and who, who's accountable? Who's telling the people to do that? And the, the people that are, are being, that are directing the workforce to work and, and do things in that manner as well. The stuff like that has to be, people, those people have to be held accountable because they're ultimately, they're working for the city uh, tax dollars, the taxpayers, right? And, and the elected councillors are the ones that are being held accountable. Yeah. <laughs> so they have to direct the, you know. Yeah, perfect. Good yeah. point. Uh, taxes, the, the, the forecast, uh, any other major things that are, that we definitely can't overlook moving forward? Well, the, when, when it comes to taxes, you know, we got to, we got to look at selling off some of our, some of our inventory when it comes to real estate. I think we've got too much real estate. Well, you're in a real estate business. It's yeah, so, <clears throat> well, and it, it only makes sense where you, we're holding on to these buildings and or whatever, you know, and we're not collecting any revenue from it. So it's costing us money on the maintenance and the upkeep of these places, but and we're not getting any property tax revenue from it. So we have to be able to, to get rid of that and quit holding on to things and and hopefully we can get some uh, revenue coming off of it and that'll help our, our uh, property tax rates at the end of the day. You're also pretty close to uh, construction developments, things like that. Are, are we, are we as open a city as uh, we like to think we are when it comes to? Well, I don't think so. I think we need to, with our development fees, I really think there's an opportunity where you have uh, certain businesses in the community that want to fix and uh, fix houses or fix, uh, you know, multifamily units, make more housing, but we're charging a, a pretty ridiculous amount of money you know, even to just get started though, without even building permits, you know, somewhere up in the areas of $9,000 per unit just to get something in, in, just to start. That's without your building permit, without even putting a shovel in the ground, you know. So if we want to be able to reduce some of our budget in some other areas of, of the city, we really have to look at how we're, uh, how we're encouraging people to to build these uh, these buildings or how we're encouraging you know, or to get the the rental units up there to a play a time where you know it might stabilize the rent, so we could have more people afford the the rent, the the market rent in the city. So I guess having a high development fee when there's no development doesn't really earn you any rent. Well, no, it does. No, it does. Doesn't earn you any development at all. You know, and you have. Uh, you have a, say, just for an example wise, you have a, a dilapidated duplex or, or a triplex in an area where you're not really going to, you're not really making any property tax revenue off of these buildings and you have a lot of them, well why not, why aren't we encouraging, you know, the, the renovation and, and, the, and the upkeep of these buildings and even expanding of these buildings where at the end of the day when they, when they're reassessed after all the renovations are complete, you're going to be bringing in more property tax revenue off of it, you know, and, and once there's a, a, a number of uh, vacant units, you know, the rental prices might actually uh, stabilize and then people might be able to come off of the, off of the uh, subsidized housing and actually get into, uh, into rental where they can afford it themselves, you know, where we don't have to subsidize that. So that's, it, it all comes down to, is it's a great big chain reaction at the end of the day. And are, are, these, are these large development fees, because everything gets passed over to the consumer. Well, it does, yeah. It, like it, so it increases the, the cost, it, or yeah. it increases the rent. <laughs> is the development fee increasing the cost of these units to the point where there's not enough demand? Or is it preventing the development of these units to begin with? I think it's preventing that. I've seen in my the personal experience is preventing the development. Okay. Right so, now, so uh, I've seen it because there's a there's a margin of, of profit that a person has to make, right? Right. To make it uh, feasible for them to undertake these projects, so. And then I guess for an individual, there's a certain amount of rent that you can't go over, or you can't afford it either. 
Yeah. So the, so the demand for these units, the demand for the rent, the, the rental units, and the demand for the low cost housing, as far as you're concerned, is there. It's just that we're at that point where it's not enough to be profitable. Like it's not profitable enough for businesses to build, and for them to build, it's just a touch too high for the people to buy. Is it? Is it kind of on that bubble? Well, I think that uh, for. It's a, the the development fees are hindering the the progress of, of being able to do it right. Yeah. So when you then you have to ask a certain amount more to the person that's renting it. So you're you're looking at if you're gonna develop a you know say a duplex into a fourplex. Now you have to add an extra you know twenty thousand dollars before you just have to add all that onto your budget. So that's gonna take you at you know. A substantial amount of time to pay that back and it's not going to be you paying it back it's going to be the the renter right so right. are you going to add another two hundred dollars a month to the people's rent who are going to move in and uh how high how, how much is too much how much is too much so it's making it not affordable mm -hmm. for the people in the area so they have to some of the people might have to go on you know get subsidized housing or, or things like that but if we could keep those fees down and keep it so Rent can become more affordable for the the people that are, are that are renting. We might be able to to take uh, an opportunity to look at some of our other uh, budget problems that we have. Is our vacancy rate for rental units um, too low for us to look at reasonably developing our our business base entirely deep? Does, I, I'm trying to. I don't know enough about real estate, but. There's, a, there's an area that's trying to develop new businesses uh, and, and, and growth in their workforce. Do you need a certain level of rental units for people that are transitioning in to these new businesses? Like, have you, have you noticed that in the market when you're looking at it? Are, is our vacancy rate too low? Is it I don't think it's uh, too low, I think. But, well, it's too low in the sense that uh, the prices are going to be inflated. Okay, so because you're, you're, yeah, it, it increases prices. I mean, you still have, there are areas of the city, you know, that have a 4% vacancy rate, which is still extremely low, but you have other areas of the city that are at 1%, you know, and a half a percent, 1%, you know, and you're looking at those places, well, you're not going to get anything in those places. And if you are, it's going to be expensive. So high demand, high, high rents. Yeah. Uh, are you hearing much about uh, transit, public transit? Not, uh, I, I, at the beginning of the campaign, I did hear a little bit about it uh, with a couple of people that I talked about. They were um, just concerned about, you know, the, the times of it and the, the accessibility of transit. So there, there has been a little bit of talk about it, but I haven't really ran into that in, so head on so far. In, in your particular area, in Ward 9, um, describe briefly what it covers? Well, it covers south of Regent, so you have the south end, you have Long Lake, um, Tilton Lake area down by there, across to Coniston, um, or should I say Wanup, like if you come out the south end up to Wanup, across to Coniston, and out to Wanup Okay, so, so it, you, you basically got the, the southeast, the, the two different uh, sectors, like in, in Ward 5, We've got all that area at the corner of LaSalle and Notre Dame and, and Cambrian Heights. You know, yeah, it's a really big war. I think it's it's mixed up, uh, yeah. actually. <laughs> it is. And then when I go when we go to the valley in, in you know, Valcaran, Guilleville, McCray Heights and, and Blizzard Valley, you've got you've got two different groups of people that have two different needs in terms of transit. Oh yeah, no, and, definitely. And, and it's and I can see that the Sudbury portion of Ward 5 would probably rely more on public transit because it's, it's, it's so dense and it's probably easier to get into the, you know, on the routes, whereas up in the valley, you've either got to be on the main drag yeah. or, or be able to walk to the main highway or you're taking your own car. Yeah. And, and I think the whole different social structure of those two different groups uh, makes it difficult to even have a single transit policy. <laughs> I remember a few years ago, we tried having an inter-valley route, and they ran it for a full year. And, and I think, I, I even think when I say 90%, that's that's a, 
that's that's too complimentary. I, I think at least ninety percent of the time the buses were running empty. Yeah. Because the people just yeah. so I'm not hearing much about the need for public transit except for the people who are close enough to get to the highway and depend on going in and out of town. And then what I'm hearing is it takes a long time to go into town and come back. Yeah. No, and you know what, it, it, it has to do, in my opinion, with urban sprawl. We have so much sprawl in, in our city that uh, our, our transit is really being affected by it. Yeah. You know, we don't, have, we don't have an efficient transit system in that sense, you know, because there's so much, uh, everybody's so spread out that it, it makes it really tough. It, it, was, uh, it was interesting when we had the, uh, um, I always get this name mixed up, but the Friendly to Senior Southern Group was in here and, and, and one of the gentlemen was talking about the, this whole urban sprawl, but he said, he said what happened though is we didn't create a city and then allow it to spread. No, we created six cities and yeah. brought them together. Yeah. Everything, not six, but yeah. you know, yeah. everything was spread and then we, we brought it together. So in other words, the urban sprawl is our own fault. Or, oh, or it, not even our own fault, it, the fault of the amalgamation. Amalgamation yeah. and the provincial government thinking that this was a good thing. Yeah. Said it was probably the reason it was the last place that was amalgamated was it was just wrong. Oh it do. is. Yeah. But now it's done, you've got to live with it. But now you've got that urban sprawl that you're trying to bring closer to the center, but now you've got to overcome the the challenges and the the objections of the people who are living in the outlying areas are saying, well, I've got the land to divide my property into four for my kids so they can come here and live, but you're not going to let me do it because of the cost of the infrastructure. Yeah. And so you're, you're into this. Yeah, so when you get into cost of transit and, and building new infrastructure, and, and plus the fact that our ground is rock. Yeah, and that makes it a lot more expensive, I think. <clears throat> And if you look at, if we were to have a more stable downtown, you would have more of a need for transit. So you would be able to afford to put more money into the transit budget and probably increase the services quite a bit if, if we could get downtown going, right? And I think that's uh, really our main stumbling block when we're looking at transit is the, the location of our main transit hub and the condition of the area that it's in. I think, uh, like when I, when I do talk to people about transit, that's going to be one of the points that I, I make sure to bring up is that you know in order for us to to really put some money into transit, we have to have the users, and in order for us to have the users, we have to have a, a place for them to go. You know, so if you look in other cities, a lot of transit users are are you know young professionals that you know they, they take transit back and forth to work every day, but if we don't have the jobs in downtown. Then it's going to be a little bit difficult to, to keep people to yeah. on the buses and, and things like that, right? So, I, I think it's it's always difficult to be spending a lot of time talking about providing and improving a service that um, only four percent of your population uses. Yeah. Well, and you know, I would, it was uh, it's quite interesting. I, I was when I did talk to the one person about uh, the transit, they were saying how there's a stigma in, in our city and in our community for using public transportation. And this is somebody who's uh, you know a, a, per, a downtown professional that works down there. And uh, the person was saying, you know, like when they take the the bus, they're stigmatized. Why do you take the bus? You know, but in, in all reality, it's you know a young professional going into the city to. To work, so if we can get those good jobs and, and attract the businesses into the downtown area, we'll be able to get a little bit more revenue for our transit mm -hmm. to help our transit. Yeah, it's interesting when you talk about the downtown because uh, we're going to have we're going to have a whole show on the constellation report that was uh, that the, I think presented to council at the beginning of two thousand seven. It's been seven years, but one of the recommendations was that you uh, strengthen the core areas yeah. of the outlying area. Like that the, you take a look at the the downtown Chelmsford, and the downtown Capriol, and the downtown and, and you don't forget that those are important parts of those communities yeah. that have to be built up. And one of the things that, you know, living in the valley since nineteen seventy four, one of the things that I've always heard about was, well our downtown is just as important as downtown Sudbury. And, and you still have that divide between the people saying, well, well, what's all the stuff about the downtown Sudbury? 
What about downtown Malacare? Yeah. What about downtown um, Garson? What about downtown Coniston? Uh, why does everything have to be downtown Sudbury? And I think you hit the nail on the head. I think we're starting, I think anyway, from what I can see, is we're starting to change focus on what, we're not sort of making the downtown a retail no. hub, but we're starting to look at making it as an educational and a professional hub. So like you say, people are brought into that area to work or, or to go to school or you know, professionals. Um, I, I'm starting to see a change anyway. It seems as, as if the stores that are closing and the ones that are being replaced are, are a little bit different. Oh no! They're I attracting so a different crowd. Yeah, and that's uh, that's all about the demand of what downtown is going to be bringing with a lot of the student housing that's going to be down there. You have your your schools that are down there, and then you have uh, there are a couple professional um, <coughs> businesses that are down there right now. But we, I'd like to really see that grow. Yeah, I'd actually really like to see uh, uh, free Wi-Fi bro being brought downtown as well. That might be something that attracts some businesses, even the startups to go down there and it'll help the students with their costs. You know, they'll have the opportunity even if it's just for uh, two or three hours a day to use the, the Wi-Fi on their on their accounts, you know. And it's done all over the world in different cities all over the world, you know. Didn't realize that but <laughs> and it it's uh and it's very beneficial. I think, and to say, well, right now some of the cities do, or some of the, the businesses do provide it, well, it should be a blanket provided but throughout the whole entire downtown area, just to bring a benefit, you know, just to bring another business down there, another, you know, jobs down there, get people down there. Yeah, good point. Another thing that, that keeps coming up, uh, before I forget, is this whole issue of, uh, of council being open and transparent and doing things in the public. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing this, you know, from a lot of different people and and there seems to be, I don't know, for, for some reason there seems to be a lot of people in, in the city of Greater Sudbury who think that a lot of stuff is being done behind closed doors or is being done in secret and, and all of a sudden decisions are being made. If you get on there and you know that that's the perception, how do you even start? Like, what what can you do as an individual counselor to make sure that 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 perception starts to get erased? Well, you just have to be as open and try and transparent to to everybody and let them know what's going on. I don't think that uh, that there really is any better way. And to just be open and you know that everything's covered on the in the media or in the, on council meetings and so it's all covered so I mean you can only be as open as you can be. Yeah and then we do things like uh, we institute new policies that are designed to uh, only allow accredited reporters into uh, council meetings and put them in certain areas they can no longer go on the floor to take pictures of and, and we've got yeah, security guards. And, um, I think that's a little ridiculous and overboard and uh, the, the, but we just, mind. How much is that even costing yeah. us? You, you saw <laughs> you saw what it did to the you know, like the public was kind of oh my god what's going on why why are you even doing that you should never want to central or not centralize but you should never even have to to uh, I don't oh. know do oh. that to a government where you, you should never have to stop the the public access to a government I mean they, you, you pay their wages you pay the cities run by their tax dollars you should never have to be they should never be putting barriers up like that for the public to be have access to their government. Yeah. And, and I think it, it really falls within <coughs> that same arena as when they introduced the rebranding of the city where it, it probably wasn't supposed to come out the way it did. It was probably more an advertising or a marketing campaign that they were going to use to try and attract business, but it turned out to be a rebranding of the city, the, the way people perceive it. And even the security issue now, uh, the idea of um, only reporters that are accredited in advance will be allowed in. Uh, I, there's probably a good intention behind it in terms of they just want to make sure they know who's coming in. But to use phrases like we're trying to put a barrier between the people and the council and we, we want to uh, 
the the funniest not the funniest but the uh when the person had said that there's people who wear knives on their belts in summer you know like oh my god or like like that person should be fired <laughs> that's what i think and that's what i would do you can't you can't be making statements like that like, there has to be accountability like, this person has been made a bad decision with the with the security it's costing it's going to cost taxpayers a lot of money it's 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 taking uh access away from the public to their to their elected officials which is is, is wrong on mm -hmm. uh, i don't know how many levels and then to general make generalized statements uh you know like uh, well we're in the north and people wear knives on their belts and we got uh, like, that person yeah yeah i don't know that see like that things like that's what i'm talking about when i talk about accountability and people yeah. making these decisions who why are <laughs> i know and and then the elected representatives end up bearing the feel, brunt, brunt of that so mm -hmm. it, it, it's almost as if the, the, the best way to resolve this is to make sure that there's a uh, the right person does all the press releases. Well, yeah, you have a communications <laughs> officer yeah, that you, does all you of know, this. That should be. And and for something like that, even if, if, if city council does need security, uh, it doesn't have to be beefed up like that. I mean, we're... And unless there's something we don't know about. Yeah, unless there's uh, threats that we don't know about, but then they should be... You know, they want to talk about transparency and, and being openness, so all that should be brought up, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, the, you know, the way it came out, and, and like I say, I, I think in many cases, the intention and the thought behind it might be good, but the way it's being delivered, the message that's coming out is just not, oh, no. not good. No. And, and it's just, this is the wrong time. Um, I got wrong year to do it. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's what I thought too. I thought, I can't believe they're doing this in an election year, but, uh, it's it's really wrong in the, in all levels, you know. Yeah. Especially if you want to engage. Uh, I think all the public should be engaged in in in, in the decision making. Yeah. You know. Do you see the store hours, uh, the referendum, uh, being much of an issue? I don't think it's going to be an issue at all because it's already people don't know what they want. They have their choices that they're going to make. They're going to be able to vote on it, and uh, I think that issue is was a should have been more, I guess, more of an issue last election, considering the direction that we ended up going. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, I don't think it's going to be an issue this time. People no. already know what they're going to. I'd say the majority of people, anyways, already know what they're going to be voting for on that referendum. So. And what I'm hearing from most of the people I'm talking to, most of the, the candidates that are running, is, is they, they're basically almost coming through saying, you know, what, if it's less than fifty percent, it's going to come to the floor as a motion, but. We're going to go with whatever the majority was, regardless of what the percent was. I think was. that's the right way to, to look at it. That's the way I, I yeah. feel as well. Yeah, it's yeah. only 40% turnout. If 70% say they, they want this answer, that's the answer got to accept. Yeah. If it's 52% turnout, then there's no question at all, it's done. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's going to be done, and it's going to, it should be done according to the majority. I think there's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, members of the public out there that think, well, what's going to happen is if it's less than 50%, the council's going to come in, they're going to vote differently than what we wanted them to vote. And I, I, that's not what I'm hearing from the council, the no, candidates. No, definitely not. You know, either way, we have to respect the decision of uh, yeah. of democracy, right? So yeah. there is a, a little glitch in, in the system that says you need 50% to, to get it, to make it binding. Yeah. But it, if it's 49% people that come out or 25% of the people come out and they come out either way, whichever way they're coming out is yep. the way that I would uh, I would put it. Yeah, the way I look at it is if you only get a 40% turnout, then 60% of the people are saying, you guys decide. Yeah. So we'll let the 40% decide. Yeah. So hey, that, that's the way I look at it. That's how I would, I would do that too. Um, the, uh, the issue of trying <coughs> to... Uh, I guess affect our population by either bringing in more people uh, to work, like like attracting more industries or attracting more people that want to make Sudbury their home. Uh, I don't. That's definitely not a new issue. I think it's been around forever. Uh, I I've heard a couple of people say that it's starting to get to the critical level though. That we're at that point where we need growth. Oh, we do somehow. Yeah, no, and what we're doing isn't working right now, so we have to look differently, yeah. right? And then when you look at the growth of the city, we're going to need to keep the people that we're educating here. We're, we're, we're educating a lot of people here you know, with between all of our uh, post-secondary 
institutions. And we gotta make it friendly for them to to open up shop here. You know, we gotta have uh, things in place where these people are gonna want to stay in Sudbury, not make it just a destination to where they're gonna be going to next. And uh, <clears throat> obviously, with those those people coming here, it's gonna create jobs, and hopefully, it'll be able to grow. Yeah. So, it, but it is something that. I think we're going to, have to spend a little bit more time uh, looking at a long-term vision for growth and looking at a long-term uh, way of making it happen. Yeah, I think if you take a look at if you if you cut the industrial development charges and and try and get people here to let the industrial companies grow, I think you're, that that would be a good start to let these businesses come here. You know, and then again with the airport, I think if we can accommodate other uh, if you look at North Bay, they they have a, a long enough runway that they can accommodate the shipping and receiving of, of things through uh, air that we can't do in Sudbury, right? So if we can let these things come into Sudbury, and if we have a strategy in place for industrial growth, it's gonna it's really gonna benefit and it'll it'll affect our growth too because if there's 30 or 40 new jobs that are coming here and we have to attract talent from other cities to come here and, and then we have another 20 or 30 new houses that we can build and have new families and there's more top property tax. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one of the last things I want to want to take a look at is we're now at the beginning of March in, in this campaign and at this point in time I only have one person who's declared that they're running for mayor. It's almost as if the entire community is waiting to see who's going to declare that they're going to put their name in as mayor. We know that John Rodriguez has already indicated he's going to uh, register on May 1st, and, and I know that that's got something to do with uh, the commitment he's got right now, um, that he has to wait until May 1st before he can get into the campaign. But um, are you getting many people wondering what's going on? How come nobody's putting their name in for mayor yet? It's no one's really talked to me about that. No. And I think a lot of people just assume that uh, that certain people are gonna are gonna end up running eventually. Eventually, okay. and, and I think it's it's, it's I think if uh, I think they should have. I mean, you look at Toronto, and you you have like thirty four mayor candidates right now. You know, so I think that if, if it was me that was running for mayor, I would have declared January 2nd, but... Do you think the provincial election is having an effect if people are waiting to see who the uh, candidates are going to be for provincial? No, I think that uh, it may have, have had an effect with campaigning itself, but not putting your name forward. Okay, because it was a rumor that uh, our current mayor might be encouraged to represent one of the parties. Yeah, I, I, was, I don't really have anything to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you don't, you haven't heard any anybody saying that. I, I know in, in my area, there's um, people are anxious to see the, the, the names of the final slates. Well, I think I think it would have been nice. Right? Yeah, I think I think it'd be nice to have uh, the some of the people out there. You know, in my ward, there's uh, six people running right yeah, now. Six, there's so four, there, there was there's no, four in mine. <laughs> yeah, I know. So there's no uh, no uh, reservations about not coming out early in these wards, you mm -hmm. know. But I, th I really think that uh, I think more competition the better. Anyway, so yeah. that that's good. It's got to be tough too to be a sitting councillor, wanting to put your name in, but you still have another year to to govern the city. Well, it doesn't. It's your job, right? Yeah. So you just got to stand by what you're gonna, what you're gonna run on, mm -hmm. and when these decisions come down, like <clears throat> the past uh, two point nine percent property tax increase. I mean, we gotta who voted for that, right? If you're running for a certain position, and if you're an incumbent councillor and you're running, you know how how can you sit here and say that you want to lower taxes and then uh, vote for a tax increase that's uh, substantially above inflation? Hard question to answer. Well, you can't, right? Well, you know the answer. It's not yeah. Yeah. It's not, so. not when people want to hear. No. So you got to have, uh, uh, you got to be ready to back it up. So it's it's even more beneficial to get out there right away. I would think anyways, yeah. if you're already there. I know you don't have to because you already have some kind of name recognition, but I think uh, 
it's important. Yeah, so it kind of starts the ball rolling when you know everybody that's going to be out there is, yeah. is in there. I, I, I know everything's fairly quiet um, on the campaign trail because there's a lot of anticipation of you know the other names that are going to come in. Yeah, well, and you know what? I think it has a lot to do with the weather as well. It's, it's hard to get out there when it's always minus 30 or snowing, yeah. you know. So I think it's going to be a good spring, and uh, I look forward to meeting with everybody in my in my Great. board. Great. Any final comments? Anything we missed that you wanted to touch base with this afternoon? Or? Well, just uh, basically that uh, you know I'm committed to bringing taxes down and to getting the spending under control and looking at ways that the, the current city council isn't really willing to entertain those ways to, to bring the property taxes uh, down. Great. Aaron Baudry, uh, candidate for Council Ward 9. Uh, it's been, been nice having you come back uh, again. I want to thank you because, uh, you know, th this show is only going to be um, effective if we can get people who are running for the positions that come in and, and take time to talk. I'm hoping within a, another month or so that when people come in, we come in, we have put 20, 30 minute talks or talk over the phone on specific That's issues. Specific like issues, yeah. One particular thing that happens to be at the forefront because uh, we know that when the media gets onto a particular issue, that's what everybody wants to hear about right yeah. away. And, and so if we have uh, well, five or six people who are willing to share their viewpoints, then... Well, I even uh, if you look at the past council meeting, the two of those uh, issues there were uh, the office supply budget, which mm -hmm. and then we had the, the, the taxi, the $50 deposit on the taxis coming out of downtown. And uh, personally, myself, I think for the there's other ways that we could have looked at uh, helping the the taxi companies and not uh, putting handcuffs on the the people that are already going downtown. Because what they just did is I think that they just uh, uh, limited the amount of people that are going to be willing to go downtown now. Yeah, and uh, we talked before uh, before going on air too. But oh, I didn't even think the taxi taxis were an issue until this past weekend when I found out. You know, all of a sudden, all kinds of people are talking about how hard it is to get a taxi in the valley. Yeah. To go home at night if you've been out drinking or socializing. Yeah. Uh, I I never would have thought that that was such a difficult problem, but it, it it leads to a whole bunch of other things in terms of if you can't get that safety um, uh, element of, of being able to go out and socialize, knowing that you're going to get a safe ride home, what do you do? Yeah, you don't go. So then you don't go, or you you don't want to see this, but you don't yeah. want to see people driving uh, intoxicated. No, and, and yet I never even thought. You know, how hard is it to get a taxi at two o'clock in the morning? Yeah, and apparently it's pretty hard. You yeah, know, in the valley. I never realized it. So is that a, is that an issue for council? Well, it me, is. I think it is because yeah. you're going to be spending millions of dollars in downtown. You know, and you're spending millions of dollars here, and then you're you're not gonna have people go there because you're putting yeah. up these walls. You know, and if people are come want to decide where they want to live in a particular community, and they ask people living, well, I'll say the valley, but it could be anywhere living in the valley. Well, do you think we should move here? And one of the first things they'll say is, no, don't move here. You never get a cab. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you you got something that should be minor, that has now become an issue. That well, if that's one thing that you're talking about isn't very good, then there must be a lot of other bigger things. Yeah. So it changes that whole attitude. But anyway, it's, it's going to be an interesting uh, seven or eight months. Yeah. With the up to the election, that's going to be even more interesting four years after that. No, but no, no. Let's hope that people are getting better informed of what the issues are and what the candidates have to say. And, and uh, like I say, I'm looking forward to more of these shows and, and we're even going to start bringing in um, candidates with two or three other people, possibly from their wards, so that they can we can actually have a little panel discussion where we're not going to have a debate among candidates, no. but we'll have uh, you know people who are actually going to be voting, saying, well, these are the issues that we're we're, we're seeing, finding important, we're finding, yeah. and, and then we, we now have the, one of the candidates able to have a conversation with uh, the constituents. So it's not always the candidate that's doing the talking. It'd be kind of like a mini meet the candidate. Yeah. Right. So anyway, thank you very much. I um, want to remind everyone again to uh, stay tuned to The Learning Clinic at CKLU 96.7 FM. And uh, I will be back momentarily to finish the show.